Welcome to the first ever live taping of Trace Material. Ava, it's good to see you again here in Zoomland, recording just as we have for the last year and a half. This time we've just got 100 plus of our closest friends listening in. Yeah, no pressure. We're grateful to all of you that are here with us listening live and to all of you in the future listening wherever you may be. We're excited to continue our exploration of plastics today. Over the course of this season, we told stories about iconic plastic objects like Tupperware or Bakelite and looked at how this material has woven itself into our culture and our bodies. Now we're looking ahead. We've traced how we found ourselves in the plastics age, but what comes next? To do that, we've got a great guest in Pete Myers. Pete is the founder and chief scientist at Environmental Health Sciences, which publishes the famous Environmental Health News, and adjunct professor of chemistry at Carnegie Mellon University. Pete has decades of experience in the chemistry of plastics, particularly with a class of chemicals called endocrine disruptors, a term he coined in the early 90s and explored in the best-selling book he co-authored called Our Stolen Future. Pete is going to share stories of his own scientific discoveries relating to plastic and discuss the role he believes designers can play in protecting the health of our bodies and environment. So Pete, welcome and thank you so much for being with us today. We're gonna to turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, should I share my screen now? Yeah, go for That's it. That's great. Okay. Um, and as I'm sharing it, let me comment that um, when I first discovered you guys about a year ago, I thought, my God, they speak my language. It's so awesome. Um, and uh, so when we finally started to talk about doing a podcast together, I was really excited. So I'm grateful to you guys for having me here. Um, we have a lot in common and we've got a lot of problems we can solve with the collective insights that uh, you folks as designers bring to issues like this. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, go into this. Uh, this is a podcast. So what do you do on podcasts? You tell stories. So instead of giving a traditional scientific lecture, which I've done too many of, I'm going to try and convert that into uh, four quick stories and then leave time for, uh, for discussions and questions. The first one I'm going to call the plastic conundrum. The second one I'm going to call Design Failures and Dante's Inferno. The third one I will call From Cement Overshoes to Helping Chemists Make Money. And finally, Using Design to Move Toward Sustainable Chemistry. Those are the four stories. And they are woven together. Um, and I hope this works for you. My granddaughter is part of this story as as the epitome of the plastic conundrum. She was born two months premature. She spent the first two months of her life in a NICU, surrounded by plastics. She was there because my daughter came down with preeclampsia um, two months before the scheduled birth date and rushed to the hospital and had an emergency cesarean. Well, it's, it turns out there's a, a side to that story that not many people are aware of. I don't mean her personal story, but rather what types of things cause preeclampsia. My daughter, uh, when she was in her fifth month of pregnancy, was living in Oakland, California. And in November of 2018, the smoke from the Paradise Fire, called the Camp Fire, came down from that northern west northeast corner of california and surrounded the bay area in fire it was i was happened to be there by accident coincidentally and it was the worst air pollution the bay area had experienced to date it's gotten worse since with additional fires but when you think about those fires they involve not just burnt trees but burnt houses and burnt plastic a lot of plastic is in any of these fires that occur at the forest uh, uh, building interface. And when I learned that my daughter had experienced preeclampsia with the forced cesarean, literally within 15 minutes, I had discovered 
articles in the scientific literature, which is where I usually live, uh, linking preeclampsia to the stuff that was in that smoke surrounding her house. So when you think about the NICU where my granddaughter lived for her first two months, it's also full of plastics, not smoke, but real plastic. And, um, I, and that plastic in the NICU saved her life. I have no question about that. But at the same time that it saved her life, there were enough phthalates and bisphenols and other things in those plastics that she was being contaminated the entire time she was there. So on the one hand, the plastic exposure in the smoke may have caused the preeclampsia. I don't know for sure, certainly plausible. And then once she's in the NICU, the plastics that are there are both saving her life and possibly altering it adversely for the rest of her life because she's been exposed. So the question, the conundrum that we face with plastic is how did we get there? How do we get to this circumstance where we have this miracle set of materials that can do anything, almost it seems, and do everything, it seems, yet at the same time are serious threats to health? How do we hold those two notions in mind and how do we get out of it? How do we move forward? And that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so that's the first story. The second story is the plastic inferno. Um, this is, uh, well, if you think about the plastic inferno in relation to Dante's inferno, there are actually some similarities, but let me put it this way. The global plastic cluster uh, meltdown that envelops, envelops us today is a result of massive design failure, massive, coupled with ignorance and greed, fraud and treachery. The good news is we can perhaps work our way out of it, acknowledging these problems, facing them head on, implementing a new design paradigm and living and having it guided by modern scientific understanding. Plastics came to us because chemists and chemical engineers have been extraordinarily effective at manipulating the periodic table of the elements. What they have wrought enables modern life from beginning to end. Almost every material object in our lives owes something to the genius of the chemical enterprise. That's, that's true. They achieved this, those chemical engineers and chemists achieved this with, with a maniacal focus, I think, on technical performance and cost performance. That focus enabled the genius. It rewarded them for manipulating the periodic table of the elements, but it left out the design criteria whose absence has created this global plastic cluster uh, meltdown. Help with, and those criteria that are missing are health performance, environmental performance, and fairness performance. We need to get these other dimensions of performance on equal footing as design criteria in the creation and scaling of new plastics. So where has this brought us? It's brought us into the plastic inferno. Unpeeling toxic, to the, the toxicity of plastics is sort of like diving into Dante's Inferno or more modernly, perhaps a Stephen King novel. The first level of that toxicity are the means of production. These burden local communities with devastating diseases. And it's the most uh, obvious component of the missing dimension of fairness performance. These are people who uh, don't benefit from most of the chemistry that is performed in their communities and they get sick as a result with devastating diseases. So that's the first level. The second level is that the monomers that are used to make plastics, the monomers like bisphenols, like a variety of other things, that those think of the monomers as the recycling codes one through seven. And some of them are not, not toxic, but 
things like bisphenol A certainly are toxic. Um, and uh, some by themselves, while they aren't, they also can be found in combination with others that are. So the third level is that the polymerized, the polymerized monomer by itself is rarely, rarely sufficient to make a product. Additives are put into the polymer to alter its material characteristics into what chemical engineers need to make a product. Like phthalates are used to make plastic softer and they're also used for a bunch of other stuff so that they're virtually ubiquitous in plastics. Almost all plastics sold contain one form of additive or another. Many of those additives are toxic. Many more have not be, yet been tested, especially for hazards arising from low dose exposure to endocrine disrupting compounds of which those additives often, to which those additives often belong. The fourth level of plastics inferno involve what are called non-intentionally added substances. These are reaction byproducts that are formed when the plastic is made. They're impurities that were in the reagents or they're some combination thereof. We know that thousands of these are possible and most of them have never been tested for toxicity, even though that some are known to be toxic. In the, the fifth layer toward hell are the toxic materials that adhere to the surface of plastics. This is especially important for marine plastics because the surface of the ocean is a thin micro layer that concentrates persistent organic pollutants. And it's here that many marine micro, macro, macro plastics, all those big things that we hear about in the, in the um, uh, gyres of plastics around the oceans, many of those big marine microplastics are roiling around in the, that, that micro layer of plastics that contain persistent organic pollutants for a long time. There is a sixth layer as well. And that's the, what happens, for example, when the campfire burned all those plastics and sent them into the air and sent them downwind to communities that lived downwind. Primary among these, particularly if you have PVC in building and whose house doesn't contain some amount of PVC, polyvinyl chloride plastic. When PVC burns, it forms dioxins, which is one of the most uh, potent of all of the toxins known, toxic compounds known on the planet. There is another layer, the seventh layer, and it's, it's the mountains of plastics that will never be recycled. Where the ones that do get into recycling system, the re recycling system, they're often involved, that often involve these crazy schemes that are wholly ignorant of the inherent toxicity of many plastics. Some of, for example, some of these schemes involve creating new problems at a scale that will likely be unsolvable like making roads or houses out of recycled plastics. That guarantees massive human exposure to toxicity when the recycled materials are used exactly as is planned. Well, on the eighth and ninth level, actually the, the, uh, the plastics inferno converges directly upon Dante's eighth and ninth level to fraud at the eighth and treachery on the ninth. The fraud is carried out in the science done by companies wishing to hide the toxicity of their products and by the manufacturers of doubt described in great length by a famous book by Markowitz and Rosner. I hope you all have read it, the book, Deceit and Denial. And that work is also echoed in a very recent book by David Michaels called The Triumph of Doubt. That's fraud. The treachery is the hundreds of millions of dollars spent over decades by industry campaigns designed to pass the responsibility of their plastic waste off to the consuming public. It still goes on ever more sophisticated with promises that the next generation of recycling efforts will work 
despite decades of past experience. So there's Plastics Inferno. I'll return to look at the next stages of Dante's divine comedy in a bit, but first, another story. And that is from Cement Overshoes to Helping Chemists Make Money. I have a confession to make. Um, my background is sort of liberal, um, sort of is an understatement. I went to Reed College. My t-shirt at Reed College, the official Reed College t-shirt, which still is sold in the bookstore, reads atheism, communism, free love. And I went from there to, to Berkeley, where I got a PhD, uh, not exactly a denizen of conservative thought. So when I then moved into the field of endocrine disruption, and I, and this was in the late 1980s, and with Theo Colborn and Diane Dumanowski, I wrote a book called Our Stolen Future about endocrine disruption. Um, I had no idea no appreciation of the potential role that the private sector could play in solving these problems. That changed one night in Camden, New Jersey, right after the book had been published and I was going to uh, lectures, I was giving lectures in lots of places to friendly audiences, to hostile audiences, whatever. And this was in Camden, New Jersey and it was the Society of Plastics Engineers not my friends. And these talks were often accompanied by barbs, verbal barbs, if not javelins being thrown at me. Um, industry used to send someone to each of these talks and make sure I was pummeled. Um, so I, I gave the talk. And by the way, I, I grew up a little bit on the East Coast where Camden, New Jersey, the site of this lecture was where they used cement overshoes if they didn't agree with you. Um, and so I gave the talk, it was confrontational. And then um, everyone left, except for two big guys in the back of the room. And they walked towards me. And I, frankly, I became worried because I was thinking of those cement overshoes and what happens in Camden. So they walk up to me and they lean over the lectern and they say, Dr. Myers, we like what you're doing. And I sort of squeaked, what? No, we like what you're doing. You're making certain commodities plastics unsellable in the market. And we've got the replacements. And we're going to make a lot of money. I had never thought of it that way. That the market can fix things that regulations, especially in today's world where regulations are, are all bollocked up, um, can move glacially at best, if at all, and, and often backwards. Um, so I began to think about the potential for collaborating with chemists, synthetic chemists who are designing new things and, and looking to help them understand that at least with respect to endocrine disruption, we know enough science now to make things that are much safer than were made in the great period of plastic diversity, diversification, when almost none of this stuff was known. So I worked with a team of scientists, a mixture of endocrine disruption specialists and synthetic green chemists to develop an intellectual protocol that would help chemists design safer materials. It had never been done before at this scale. We published it in the Royal Society of Chemistry's journal, Green Chemistry. Um, and it has set in motion a series of things that I think are really interesting, but mostly for me, what this process did was it, it made me to think about the old triangle of reduce, reuse, recycle, the three R's, and realize that they're somewhat misguided because if, if nothing else, recycling is a farce. I'm sorry to say that, but it is. So what replaces the three R's? Well, I think one is we got to rethink stuff. 
we have we don't have to use plastic for everything we use plastic for today. We can reduce the use of plastic by rethinking what is an essential use. Some of the uses in a neonatal intensive care unit are probably irreplaceable, but there are others that are not. And we have to go through this very carefully. A second part of this is vitally important, as I'm sure all of your audience will understand, is we have to redesign plastics chemically. We have to get in there and think about what are the design criteria we need to use and then work with synthetic chemists to make those design goals realistic. It's hard, but it's definitely possible. And I'll give you an example in a, in a few minutes. Um, and the third thing, which I don't really have time to talk about today is we've got to reform the regulatory process. It is, it, it verges on being fraudulent in terms of the science that it uses. That uses science out of the 16th century, the 17th century, 18th and 19th, not out of the 21st century. And when we reform the regulatory process, there will be a, a number of materials, chemicals, plastics that disappear because we will discover, confirm how harmful they are. So reform is really important too. I'll be happy to talk about that, that later. But let me go back to the issue of redesign. And while this is not quite about plastics, it is about using design principles in chemistry. And how do you use those to move towards sustainable chemistry? It does have implications for plastic, which I'll, I'll get to, but it begins in 1980 when a guy named Terry Collins, who at the time was a postdoc at Stanford, began to ask, well, how can we mimic, biomimic, the enzymes that our body uses to detoxify chemicals, including some plastics, uh, and also to kill uh, infectious uh, organisms like viruses and, and bacteria? So that was back in 1980. And there in the Stanford library where he was a postdoc, he set forth a design process, an iterative design process that he pursued for the next 40 years to achieve the, not just the biomimicry of peroxidase enzymes, those things that are in our bodies, but to make the synthetic versions of them dramatically more powerful and effective. And what he did, and this is kind of deep chemistry and I'll, I'll skip over most of it, but he designed a, a, what he calls an iterative design protocol where he would, he would begin imagining what a small mimic of what the peroxidase enzymes did would look like. And then building that, making the potential catalyst, testing it under controlled conditions, figuring out how well it worked, how well it didn't work, thinking about, well, why didn't it work? And what can I do to make the, the vulnerable places in the, in the molecule more resistant by using his chemical insight? And the guy's a genius. And then repeating that process time and time and time again, until he ultimately created a molecule, a, a family of catalysts that are called Tamil catalysts that have that at the core have iron that interacts with hydrogen peroxide in a way that's very similar to what peroxidase enzymes do, but in a way that is up to a thousand times more powerful than peroxidase enzymes and um, can be produced commercially. That took a long time, but now it's ready for market. And Terry and I have formed a company called SUDOC, S-U-D-O-C, Supra Ultra Dilute Oxidation Chemistry, um, that commercializes these, these molecules in ways that uh, I, I think are going to revolutionize a number of different industries that depend that are useful today to destroy infectious agents and also to um, destroy dangerous molecules, but 
with the catalyst that we've that Terry has created, um, we do it faster, safer, cheaper uh, than anything that's currently available in the market, except for us. And our first product gets rid of black mold. It's called Dot. Um, and it, it's just phenomenal how effective it is and how safer it is than other competing products. Um, one of the things we've done, part of the design process, beyond Terry's initial iterative design process, is we are doing more testing for chemical hazards than has ever been done before. And it's being done by a group of my colleagues from the field of endocrine disruption, Tyrone Hayes, Tom Zeller, Fred Vomsal, and Laura Vandenberg. And they are in charge of the testing. They do the studies, they analyze them, they publish them. We don't have any control over their use of their data, um, but we are committed to ensuring that with them leading us, we're not creating tomorrow's problems with today's solutions, which has been a problem for a long, long time. Um, I'm very proud of that. I'm also proud of the fact that I have given all of my shares in this company to what's called a, a irrevocable grantor trust, so I don't benefit financially. Um, that trust will become, if we are successful, a large funder in the field of environmental health and green chemistry, a charitable funder. So that's 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 an interesting, unprecedented new way to approach a chemical company um, with the testing we're doing, beginning with the design process that Terry figured out how to implement, uh, and uh, with the bulk of the shares owned by a public trust. So here we've got that triangle again of rethinking, redesign, reform, we can make this work. And a key part of it, as all of you know, is design, the design process. Without design, we have nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Uh, that was fascinating. And I think a really good case for uh, the power of storytelling to communicate a lot of these ideas. I think the, uh, the plastics inferno is going to stick with me for a long time. Um, so we're going to move to uh, the Q&A portion of the day now. Um, and we've got some audience questions for you, Pete, but I have one that I wanted to uh, bring up before, before we move to that. And I think Ava may have one as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned um, you know, that we, you didn't have a ton of time to talk about reform. Uh, during this talk, but I wonder if you could speak because I know in our, our, our chats before before this event, um, reform is something you've been working on for a very long time and have dedicated a lot of time to. Um, and I wonder if you could speak to some of the progress that's been made uh, in that realm. So reform, we have a regulatory system for managing chemicals that's screwed up. Um, it's complicated by uh, conflicting interests, you know, within the agencies that are responsible and between agencies and companies. Um, the key thing, one of the key failures of the regulatory system is to use modern science. It just it doesn't happen. Uh, and in particular, the, the core driving concept of regulatory toxicology and how you test things for safety is that the dose makes the poison. Well, that was a, that's paraphrasing a 16th century toxicologist, and it ignores modern endocrinological science. It, it, it works for some types of toxic chemicals, but for endocrine disrupting compounds, it simply does not work because, and I could go on at length on this, and I'll save you that, but basically hormones do different things at different doses, not just more at higher doses. In fact, sometimes hormones at high doses are shut down by the high dose. Low doses do different things than high doses. So if you're testing procedures, begin with high doses and you never test the low doses, you miss a lot of stuff. You miss huge effects, really important effects. For me, I think graphically the most striking is that if you take a mouse, and, and this has been confirmed in people, if you take a mouse and expose it to 
a very low amount of an endocrine disrupting compound right at birth, one part per billion, as what toxicologists regard as a tiny amount, it grows up morbidly obese. Okay, that's one part per billion. If you give it a thousand parts per billion, it is skinny compared to the control animal. The opposite effect occurs at high doses than, high, than at low doses. So any testing protocol that thinks you're gonna reveal the high doses, or reveal low dose effects by testing high doses is wrong. And that assumption underpins all regulatory toxicology as it is practiced today around the world. We are seeing some breakthroughs in Europe. The European Food Safety Authority just last month called for an international commission to urgently study how this sort of phenomenon can be incorporated into regulatory toxicology. It will change a lot of chemistry. Just as one example, if you were to acknowledge the low doses, the, the low dose effects of bisphenol A, a plastic, a plastic chemical, if you were to acknowledge in the FDA's own data, low dose effects, that are there and are statistically significant, using this concept of low dose versus high dose being different, the, the safe dose of BPA that FDA, the US Food and Drug Administration currently recognizes, that safe dose would be reduced by a factor of 20,000, not 20, not 200, 20,000 fold. BPA would disappear from most uses in the marketplace because it's not safe at low doses. So that's the sort of reform we have to encourage to take place. Europe is definitely leading the way on it, not just the, Europe, the, um, the European Food Safety Authority, but also the European Commission itself has committed to using endocrinological principles in guiding the chemical safety the chemical strategy for sustainability program they just announced a year ago. So we're moving in the right direction. The US is stalling. Um, I could tell stories about that, but won't. Um, anyway, that's that's the sort of reform we need. It's it's big, it will have big effects, and it's really important for people's health. Um I would love for you to get into the situation in the US just a little bit. Is this something that people should be advocating their Congress people for, or is it something that is beginning at the FDA? Um, is there kind of now that you know we're making our audience aware of this problem and how regulation is so behind, what can we do about that? Well, um, yeah, definitely you should contact uh, your member of Congress demanding that the FDA adopt modern science in regulating chemicals. It does not today. It's, it's shameful uh, in its behavior. Just to give you one example, um, in 2012, uh, I, I had led a, we, we published a big article in, the sci in a scientific journal, major scientific journal, on this phenomenon of low dose versus high dose. And as a courtesy, we contacted the FDA telling them, we're about to publish this, would like to talk to you about it because it's gonna be a challenge to your current practices. We met with them, big meeting, all, there were 12 authors to the paper. Uh, there were multiple FDA representatives. There were other uh, agencies represented in the meeting. And I, I'll never forget sitting down across the table from one of the lead FDA scientists. And she looks at me and she says, we don't see things like that. And I said, of course you don't. You don't, don't test at the right levels. You'll never see if you don't test at the right levels. And she looks at me and she says, oh, oh, you're right. Well, 15 minutes later, I heard her tell one of my colleagues the exact same thing. We don't see things like that. And then a year later, she had left the FDA and was working for a company that protects chemicals from regulation. Mm -hmm earning 10 times what she had earned at the FDA. This is a big problem. The revolving door between agencies and industries is a really big problem. Um, and it's part, re finding out how to change that is a key part of getting the agency to use modern science. 
Right, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. But frightening information, certainly. Um, so I'm going to kind of change course a little bit and talk before we get to the audience questions. Um, obviously, the COP26 summit has been in the news quite a bit these past few weeks. Um, and with that, carbon emissions. So is there an overlap between the reduction of endocrine disruptors and the reduction of carbon? Yes, there is. Um, bottom line, uh, most endocrine disrupting chemicals, synthetic chemicals, almost all of them are from petrochemicals. So they're involved when you make endocrine disrupting chemicals for use in manufacturing, you're making things using energy and you're make, making things using petrochemicals. And that has multiple implications, but they, a study just came out a, a month ago from um, Bennington College, uh, the Beyond Plastics Coalition, led by Judith Inc., calculating that within the next couple of decades, petrochemical uh, plastic production will contribute more carbon to the atmosphere than coal. So it's a big deal. And it, it's also something that plays out not just in the manufacture of the chemicals, but in their entire, entire, entire lifetime. Because as these things are thrown into landfills, they degrade, they emit uh, carbon. Um, and it, so it's, it's an unending process that uh, these are contributing to that. And then there's one other thing that um, is going to be more and more important. Um, a lot of the chemicals that are involved in endocrine disruption are what's called semi-volatile. They, when they are heated in the sun, for example, they evaporate and they go into the atmosphere. And then they go somewhere in the atmosphere, they're carried by air currents and they find up themselves in a somewhat cooler place where they condense and they fall out. And this process repeats itself and it winds up putting a lot of persistent organic pollutants and other semi-volatile things that include endocrine disruptors into cold places like the Arctic, in the Arctic snow, in glacial snow. And now we are seeing a resurgence of, for example, DDT, which has been trapped in glacial snow for decades, is now being released because those glaciers are melting. So that's a whole other dimension to how these chemicals contribute uh, or, or it, it's, a, it's another dimension to how these chemicals interact with climate change to cause health problems. Oh, well, yeah, more terrifying information. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's move to some questions from the audience, if that's all right with you, Pete. We sure. have one uh, here from Claudia. Claudia says, I'm very interested to know whether the way that we best face reducing plastics is to look at what we did before the invention of plastics and or invent new biodegradable plastics and or something else. Well, thanks for the question. It, it, it's really an important question and we don't have all the answers to it, but you will not be surprised when part of my response is we've got to redesign plastics. We have to say, okay, um, we're going to design them to be biodegradable. We're going to design them to be non-toxic. We're still going to use some plastic, but if we also rethink how we use plastic, we'll re we, we will be able to reduce the total use of plastic. Um, we're never going to, I'm sorry, some of my colleagues in the plastic world will be upset by my saying this, I suspect. We'll never be completely free of plastics because they're, they accomplish miracles. Uh, the plastic mat materials do amazing things, especially in healthcare. We've got to figure out how to make those plastics that we absolutely need, whose uses are essential, safe. And that means changing the design criteria that we've been using, which is basically how much do they cost and how do they perform, to include three other dimensions. One is the environmental dimension, one is the health dimension, and one is also the, something that my colleague Terry Collins calls the fairness dimension. Because when you think about the production of plastics, there are lots of poor communities that live downwind of plastic production facilities who are suffering terrific, horrific, yes, horrific health costs. It's not fair 
they are paying the, the externalized cost of producing materials that we then use. So in addition to the economic and performance criteria, our design criteria must include environmental health and fairness. That's great. Yeah, the environmental justice aspect is huge in, yes. in the production of plastics. Um, and this is a somewhat related- You guys related... covered that very well. You guys covered that very well in earlier episodes of-, of Oh, thank materials. you. I, it, was, it was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, a I'll, I'll give a little shout out, episode four, for those of you who haven't listened. Um, so this is a, a related question from Sarah, um, or somewhat related. With all the plastic out there in the world, what should we do with it? Should we collect it and try to put it somewhere where, where it will be inert? Can we ever recycle it? Um, I know in your talk, you mentioned, you know, roads made out of recycled plastic is a bad idea. So is there a use for it that would be safer? That's a tough question. I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Um, because as I've said, when you take a mix of plastics, some of which have toxic characteristics and some of which have non-toxic characteristics, you wind up with the final result being something with toxic characteristics, okay? That's just simple chemistry. Um, so if you're gonna be recycling and using them in subsequent uses, uh, you've gotta be able to separate the toxic from the non-toxic. And that's a wicked problem. It's right now, I don't think we can do it. Um, I do think that collecting plastic from places it's escaped in the environment is a necessary part of the process. But then we've got to be much smarter at figuring out how we dispose of that. Burning is, is not, not good because burning plastic produces many serious chemicals, including dioxins, depending upon which plastic it is. So when you make a house out of recycled marine plastic, you're creating a, the potential of exposing a lot of people to dioxins when that house burns and they will burn because plastic is very flammable and and isn't, doesn't and we're seeing in especially in California and Australia today that the places where people have built houses at the interface between suburbia and forest those houses burn and when they burn they burn with plastic and that plastic produces toxic gases. So I, I don't have an easy answer to this. Um, maybe there's a way to gather them, lock them up in some place where they're inert and then figure out how to deal with them in the future. But we don't have an answer that's safe today. So we were wondering, and we kind of spoke this a little bit earlier, what are the things that everyday people, both small actions and you know, bigger actions that we can do to combat this problem in everyday life? We can be inspired by Deanna Cohen, who is the founder of the Plastics Pollution Coalition, who lives as close to a plastic-free life as I have ever seen. Um, shout out to Deanna and the Plastic uh, pollution coalition. They are, are making individual steps to help people choose to avoid plastic. And they're, some of the things they do are profoundly important. They also are involved at policy levels um, in, in encouraging the adoption of important public policies uh, in, at the U.S. federal level, as well as at the California state level and elsewhere. So I would encourage anyone who's interested in this to seek out the Plastic Pollution Coalition as one source of guidance for what you can do. Um, so something that we, we talked a little bit about uh, towards the end of, of this season was um, sort of balancing where the burden falls in terms of consumer or personal responsibility versus corporate and uh, governmental responsibility for, for the reduction of plastics. I wonder, you started to speak to that a little bit, but I wonder how you balance that in your mind. A great question. Um, I, I think we have been deluding ourselves and we have been encouraged to delude ourselves 
by large companies who want to foist the responsibility for recycling plastic onto the consumer. Um, they're going to have to make some major changes that involve some of the types of design issues that I talked about and, and redo how they work with plastics. Um, they are not making the right sort of commitment today. They're still trying to encourage people to think that recycling is the answer. And we, if you look at the projected growth in plastic production that's going out to 2050, and you realistically examine the reality that at most 8% of plastic is recycled now, at most, and some of that recycling is not very responsible. And everyone's trying really hard, but not everyone hits the goal. There is no way that any of the recycling plans that I've seen can grow substantially to meet the challenge of that exponential growth in plastic production. We're just going to get worse if we continue with business as usual. All right, so that I think has to be our last question, but it is something you know interesting to think about as we all go out into our daily lives and, and try to reduce our plastics. Um, you know, obviously, I think I think probably most of us here do, but it is you know not our our we can't do it all. Um, so, you know, just thank you so much for spending this time with us. Uh, thank you to the audience for such ex excellent questions and for joining us um, for our first ever live taping of Trace Material. And thank you to everybody who's listened for the past two seasons. It's, it's wonderful to um, have such a, a great and engaged audience. And, and if you haven't listened, go back and listen because it's really good. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> thank you for that shout out, Pete. And thank you uh, for being with us and sharing your stories and your expertise with us. It's added so much to our understanding of plastics and to our ongoing conversation about plastics. Long may it continue. Great. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. It was mm -hmm. a pleasure and honor to be here.